I think we're going to call this meeting to order. I would like to introduce Mrs. Brown. She is our speaker that Leslie has gotten from Beyond Clean. Nice. All right. All right. For the sake of this presentation, I'm going to do the sans masks so that you can all hear me. <laughs> Happy Friday. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. Can I just tell you that you being at an empty airport, working on <laughs> your professional development in person on a Friday night, just such a big deal. Just such a big deal. So congratulations to all of you for your dedication. Um, and certainly congrats to Leslie for hosting the event and, and doing a lot of the, the detail planning. Um, I'm Lindsay Brown, I work for Beyond Clean. I've been in the sterile processing industry for almost 10 years. Uh, in a couple of different capacities. I used to work for a company called Key Surgical. Um, I was with them for quite a number of years and started their education program while I was there. I worked for Isham headquarters out of Chicago um, prior to joining the Beyond Clean team back in October. And I've been a sterile processing tech for about four and a half years now as well as the University of Minnesota. And so one of the things that I wanted to do uh, while I was at Key Surgical was I asked myself, I was like, okay, you're in charge of putting together education for frontline technicians, the people who are doing the hard work to prepare instruments for use in surgery. And you're not a sterile processing tech. I mean, something needs to change here. So I became one and have been on, you know, on the staff ever since. And so it's a, one of the surgery centers associated with the Fairview UMP uh, program up in Minneapolis. Uh, I drove over here about three hours, not too bad. My husband's sitting downstairs working in one of the, <laughs> one of the baggage claim areas. Um, but I actually <laughs> like to see you down there. Yeah, <laughs> you should be directing traffic. <laughs> yeah. We'll put him to work next time. Um, I grew up in one of the big ones, so I grew up in, um, and, uh, uh, okay, soft skills next, here we go. Um, but we're going to talk about a mix of hard and soft skills that relate to not only sterile processes, but also to healthcare in general. It's your hospital facility from a 10,000 foot level, and then also we're going to put it under a microscope for a little bit. Um, I want to share a story before I get started. Um, the last time I rode on an airplane, which seems like it was, oh gosh, it seems like it was about a year ago. The last time I was on an airplane, I'm one who typically takes the middle seat, right? My legs are short. I don't really care. I have one of these luxury neck pillows that stops the head bob. You know the one I'm talking about? You fall asleep and your head kind of <laughs> goes like that. This sucker, you can wear it backwards, forwards, and your head just stays in place. It's glorious. I love it. And so I found my seat, my middle seat, halfway to the back of the airplane. I got comfortable, but not too comfortable, right? Because I knew that some passenger would come along and need me to move to get me to the window seat. So there I am, sitting in my middle seat, casually trying to make eye contact with the person who is about to be my closest friend for the next 90 minutes. Right? So you walk, see people walking down the aisle, and all of a sudden, someone's holding your eye contact a little longer than this, and you're like, okay, that's going to be my buddy, right? Yeah. And so we nod, we nod, and then like any classic Minnesotan, I've been in Minnesota for 15 years, and what every classic Minnesotan would do is leave with, not hi, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry seems to be the new high in Minnesota. So I stand up, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yep, come on in. The gentleman gets in his window seat and gets situated. I sit back down in my middle seat with my glorious neck pillow on, ready to get comfortable. We situate our bags as far away from the customer's bags as possible. It's one of the same amount of space, right? But you just kind of want to, like, not intrude, right? Elbows are choice. I consider myself a fairly disarming, friendly person. Right? I love nicety. My husband goes crazy. He's like, why do you have to say hi to everyone we pass? And so, Come on, why not? So, why not say hi to everyone you see? I don't know. Um, so I love nicety. So I did the thing that some people love, some people hate, where I said, so, what are you traveling for? I, I was 
coming home or you're heading out for a work or pleasure. And I was fully expecting there was the one line response, something along the lines of, oh, just heading home, I'm pretty excited. And then that would be it, right? That would be it. Or no, I'm just heading out for another work trip. I seem to always be on the road these days. The end, right? Move on to our face forward, me fast asleep, probably drooling <laughs> uh, on my neck pillow. Oh. But what I got instead was more along the lines of a monologue. He turned to me and he said, well, you know, I've been on the road for two weeks now. The last week I've been on four different airplanes. I hardly had time to grab lunch, so I grabbed the sub, which I had already started to smell. <laughs> Someone sits next to you with a sub sandwich on the airplane, you're like, come on. <laughs> right? I barely have time to eat, so I grabbed the sub sandwich. I didn't have time to grab coffee, so I'm super tired. I haven't seen my kids in a week. On and on, and I'm sitting here like, Okay. <laughs> I think he's going to get the hint if I should go like this, because I was just expecting that casual one sentence exchange with no investment, right? And so as I'm planning my exit strategy, looking at the rows in front of me and behind me, like, okay, where are the empty seats? Is this what my entire 90 minute flight is going to be like? He stops and he looks at me and he goes, you know, I haven't talked to anyone for this long about something non-business related in quite a few days. Thank you for caring. Oh. And I said, to, I, in my like, you know that moment where everything, like your mind is already at your exit strategy. You're far down that road. And all of a sudden, everything starts rewinding fast, almost like fast forward, but rewind and bringing you back into that moment. And in my head, I was like, I haven't cared a single second. In this. But in his mind, I've cared what he said this whole time, and that was impactful. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what it means to care. We're going to understand what it means to care. In that situation, while I was on that plane, getting comfy in my, in my middle seats, right, neck pillow and toe, I was not under any stress. I was not preparing for add-on cases for the day. I was not being, you know, in, in any sort of communication with OR staff who are also struggling to maintain composure because they're under stress. I was just sitting there trying to enjoy the flight. So caring in that situation shouldn't have been that hard. And yet I can reflect on that and say, I honestly didn't really care to have that conversation. So we're going to put that aspect of caring into what we do on a daily basis in still processing and in the hospital. We're going to talk about the business of caring. Because we all work in one of the biggest businesses in the United States, and that business is healthcare. And my click is over there. <clears throat> what does it mean to care? We can consider the following things. As healthcare providers, Healthcare staff, healthcare professionals, we provide care to patients. We take care of people. The tests that we do on a daily basis help somebody or hurt somebody, dependent, right? We also, as sterile processing professionals, the care and handling of instrumentation is part of our responsibility. We not only care for the people on the other end, on the receiving end of surgeries, but we care for the tools that are going to operate on them successfully or otherwise. But as humans, and put yourself in whatever situation you want, just from a human to human contact perspective, is there a limit to how much we can care, to our capacity to care? And those are the things that we're gonna talk about today, okay? Let's break those two, two aspects of caring apart for just a minute. We're gonna talk about providing patient care and then caring in general at the, the tail end of this presentation. So when we think of providing patient care, we can break that into three different pieces. We can put that into patient care from a non-medical perspective. We can look at it from a medical perspective, and we can look at it from an emotional perspective, because we all know that emotions fly in the healthcare facility, especially when it comes to, to working with patients who are fearful or anxious or hopeful, or you know, the emotional capacity runs the full gamut. Offering non-medical care to our patients can look 
like different, it can come in different forms, okay? Offering patient care in general is a dynamic process. And so when we take a look at offering non-medical care, that can look like the following. It can look like the exchange of information. Did we work with our patients to make sure that they felt informed about the procedure that they're going to have? Do they feel like they have the proper information that they need to get to where they need to be within the healthcare facility? Is their patient information accessible to all of their healthcare providers that they're going to be seeing during their visits or during their surgery? Providing patient care from a non-medical perspective can look like access. Access to a healthcare facility, access to a specialist or a healthcare provider that's tuned in to the specific ailment that you're going to the hospital to get seen. Patient care from a non-medical perspective can look like proper communication. Communication with them about, here's where you park, here's where you check in, this is the, the check-in, check-out procedure. Communicating with their providers so that they feel heard. And patient care from a non-medical perspective can look like the administrative duties, like that, that check-in, check-out process that I mentioned, the parking validation, all those little things where if you were to come to a facility under a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety, those little details, the administrative details, can either help or hurt um, that level of emotion. From a medical perspective, when we provide patient care from a medical perspective, you might look at some of these things and say, no, I think that falls into non-medical. But let's take a look at these from a medical perspective. Trained personnel are what keeps this engine running, okay? Not just personnel, but trained personnel. So finding, first of all, the, right, the correct number of staff that you need in your department, and then on top of that, making sure that they have adequate training so that, for example, in sterile processing, they know how to reprocess a complex device, or they know what instruments going, go in which sense. <clears throat> Providing care from a medical perspective can look like having quality assurance systems in place. Okay. How many of you have a quality team in your department? Yeah? What does your quality team typically do? Do you mind if I put you on the spot? <laughs> well, she, um, she gets our education okay. and every year our faculty meetings. Mm -hmm. um, she also has a okay. Honestly, I'm so glad that you know what she does because having a quality person on staff and a lot of times not knowing what it is they do is part of the issue too. So having those quality assurance systems in place, having proper equipment and working with new technology, that's part of providing patient care from a medical perspective. If sterile processing doesn't have the equipment that they need to reprocess new instrumentation that comes through the department, that's going to be an issue. That's going to lend itself to negative patient care. With new technology, not only does sterile processing professionals have to be trained on that, but the operating room professionals as well, and the surgeons have to be properly trained on that new technology in order to provide that positive patient care. And then providing care from a medical perspective also has to do with proper medication. Administering the proper medication, such as antibiotics, for example. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is that antibiotic-resistant diseases and microorganisms have has, they've been a world health concern for a long time. And obviously, as of the last six months or so, taken kind of a backseat to the coronavirus, the current pandemic that we're in. But one of the things that I think is so interesting, I just read an article um, recently saying that during the 1918 flu pandemic, a majority of the deaths happened because of secondary bacterial infections or pneumonia. And not specifically because of the flu, but because of the pneumonia that set in. And so when we have those bacterial infections, when we know about them, our best resistance to those is antibiotics. And when antibiotics stop working, especially in the midst of a pandemic, that's a huge challenge. And so knowing when to administer medication, when to not administer medication, and you know, stay abreast on the recent developments of um, that antimicrobial, or anti, um, the resistant um, bacteria that exists too. So that's part of administering patient care from a medical perspective. So we talked about non-medical, we talked about medical. Let's talk about the emotional weight of giving patient care. How many of you have ever had direct interaction with patients? How many of you have ever been a patient? Okay. What are some of the emotions? I put some of them up here, but what are some emotions that you feel as a patient? 
when you're going to a hospital? Nervousness. Nervousness, okay. Maybe excitement because you're about to get fixed, <laughs> whatever ailment you're or dealing with is about to get better. Yeah. Or having a baby. Having a baby, yes, absolutely. Excitement, joy, nervousness, all are the full range. I had a baby 15 months ago, and that full range of emotions was definitely present. Worry. Say that again. Worry. Worry, yep. No control. No control, okay. Okay. Yeah. All of those emotions are valid. And there's such a broad range dependent upon why you're going to a healthcare facility. And so offering patient care and understanding the implications of the emotional side of it is important as well. And working in sterile processing, if you've never had direct patient interaction, think about the last time you went to the cafeteria. You probably passed a patient. You probably passed a patient's family member. And dependent upon what your conversation was, if you're going with a coworker, I've been in this situation a number of times where you're just, you know, you get a, you get a break from the department and you and your coworker head to the cafeteria and you're like, ah, oh, today's been such a crap day. <laughs> like, so many add-ons, I'm so stressed out. But think about who's all in earshot of that. The patients that are at your facility, their family members who are on the edge of their seats awaiting news, good or bad. Everyone within earshot can hear those conversations, so that emotional toll gets amplified. So we're going to talk about healthcare as a business. Healthcare is the biggest business in the United States, and we're going to break that down and understand the current state of a couple aspects of that business. Let's say, for example, so one of my best friends from childhood grew up in Amory, Wisconsin. Okay, does anyone know where Amory is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was actually on the um, the New Richmond Royalty Court when I was in high school. And so I met this girl through that court. She was from Amory. And she had a dream to own a business one day, a jewelry business. She wanted to make and distribute the most beautiful jewelry that she could. Okay? And so when we were in high school, she had her homemade jewelry that she would sell at local markets. So she would take her little cash box and she would fill it with as many 10s and 20s as she had and fives and ones, and she would take her homemade jewelry to the local market. Now think about a business growing. In order to grow a business, first of all, you need money, right? Secondly, you probably need some staff if you're gonna to grow to a certain level. Thirdly, you're probably going to have to take care of that staff so they are advocates for your brand, right? You're going to have to need eventually new technology and trade in that little cash box for an actual POS system that can track what you sell, any discounts you give, any returns that you have, any credit card processing payments that might come through. So you make these upgrades, okay? Those are the upgrades that we're gonna talk about when we talk about this business of healthcare. We're gonna talk about staffing and what happens when there's staffing shortages and what happens when there's burnout. And what happens when there's compassion fatigue? Have you guys ever heard that term, term mm -hmm. compassion fatigue? We're gonna talk about not only that, but also decision fatigue and what that looks like and the implications of that. Part of this business, we're gonna talk about money because part of talking about money is talking about, okay, what money are we wasting right now? What efficiencies do we not have in place leading to money that we could otherwise reinvest in our business and make it better? Where is that waste? We're gonna talk about the complexity that exists. Surgeries are becoming more complex. Technologies are, is, technology is becoming more complex. So going from that cash box to a POS system, those are the types of incremental changes that we're gonna talk about and the implications of those as a business. How many of you have ever heard the term, we're forced to do more with less? That's like a mantra for sterile processing these days. That's, that's insane. Right? But we could all wear a t-shirt doing more with less and sterile processing techs that you've passed in the grocery store are going to be like, yep, that's my reality. So we're going to talk about the implications of that as well, pertaining to this healthcare as a business. We're going to talk about waste first. Everyone's favorite topic, the topic of money. <laughs> Nobody's favorite topic if you're in my household, but billions with a B. I don't even know what billions mean. Like that is not a tangible number for me as a person. But there is billions of dollars in waste in healthcare every year. Billions. The estimated cost of waste in the United States healthcare system, get this, 
ranged from $760 billion to $935 billion per year. $935 billion per year. And six domains of waste that are often referred to are these six right here. I'm going to go into them a little bit more in detail. I did some research about these, and it's fascinating. But a majority of the waste in the healthcare system in the United States comes from these six domains. The first is the failure of care delivery. So poor adherence to clinical standards leads to over $100 billion in waste every year. Failure of care coordination. So if a patient goes to see a wrong specialist and then has to get transferred to the right specialist, and there's a mishandling of the information handoff for the patient care records, that attributes to about $50 billion in healthcare waste. The third domain is overtreatment or low value of care. And what this means is services that are medically unnecessary or that they have no medical benefit for a patient. So services that are administered with no reason attributes to $75 billion in waste every year in the healthcare industry. Pricing failures, look how much money that is. <laughs> it's over $200 billion of unreasonably high healthcare costs. Fraud and abuse. Intentional deception or misrepresentation leading to unauthorized benefits and payments. Or acting outside the code of conduct in the medical space. And then administrative complexity is the biggest area of waste. This is when you have to fill out an intake form multiple times for the same thing, or sorting through insurance documents, or transferring your medical records from one care provider to another. All those administrative costs lead to the biggest waste amount each year in healthcare. 25% of total healthcare spending is waste. And something that I find really interesting is when you look at all of the numbers on what healthcare, what's spent on healthcare every year, a quarter of it, a quarter of the money spent in healthcare is not going towards benefiting patients. It's actually doing the opposite. That's one fourth, one quarter of all the money spent in healthcare is not benefiting anybody, which is crazy to me, right? When you think about this as a, from a business perspective, you think about, okay, this is a lot of waste, there are clearly some opportunities for process improvements, right? The term that we toss around a lot, but come on. <laughs> and when you look at the airline industry, I'm sure you've heard at some seminar, some sort of parallel between the airline industry and the healthcare industry. But when you look at an airplane crash and you look at the detailed documentation of that crash, and honestly, the, the detailed, the, the pick apart everything that went wrong so that they can learn from that, and have that benefit them in the future. Learn the, the lessons from the mistake, what went wrong, what went, went wrong that we can then fix moving forward. Who's, who's fixing this? How are we looking at this business and fixing these issues? <clears throat> I'm gonna break it down for you in terms of how this impacts sterile processing. How many of you know Dr. Peter Nickel? Couple of you? Okay, so he's a pediatric surgeon in the UW Madison. He's also the Beyond Clean Chief Medical Officer. And he's one of the most fascinating individuals I've ever met. Okay, he did a presentation at the um, Minnesota conference in March. It was in Anoka, Minnesota. It was a combination of nurses and star processing techs and surgical technologists. And he broke down this case study that he did. Okay, this case study is taking a look at two of the hospitals. He's in a nine hospital system. It's looking at two of the hospitals in his system. And of those two hospitals, they do about 19,000 cases per year. They process about 600 instrument sets per day. So they have a, a shared sterile processing department between these two facilities. And they process between 60,000 to 120,000 instruments per day, depending. Okay, so that's a little snapshot of that department. When they took a look at the potential for waste, the potential for savings, 
the potential for taking a look at hard costs and soft costs and figuring out where are the discrepancies, where are the areas that we can improve upon, they found this. They took a look at the costs involved with overtime, with turnover, with travelers, and other HR-related costs related to those things, and found that in a year, they spent $1.4 million on those specific costs, hard costs, $1.4 million on those specific costs. When they looked at the cost of re-sterilizing unused instruments, you can consider about 60, 63, 67 cents per instrument that it costs to reprocess it, okay? When they looked at their specific trays, their specific instruments, and the cost associated with re-sterilizing the instruments that were not used in surgeries, they wrapped up $6.7 million in waste. And then when they looked at case delays, how many of you, have ever heard an OR minute costs a certain amount of money? Yeah, Does anyone know what? That's usually $130. Yeah, $130, $140. Yep. So when they looked at the case delays, so what they experienced was about one instrument delay per case in their ORs. And when they extrapolated that out, they found that the case delays attributed to $10.7 million in waste. And whether, obviously, the, the delays could be for various reasons. Right? But that's a lot of money. This does not include medical instrument repair costs. And this facility, these two facilities um, spent millions of dollars on repair costs. And most healthcare facilities spend a large chunk of change on, on repair costs. But these numbers don't even include that. If they did, the annual waste would equal over $100 billion a year in the United States, based on how many surgeries typically happen in a given year. This also does not include any legal fees or lost instrumentation. How many of you experience lost instruments on an almost hourly basis? How does that happen? <laughs> but that adds up. The cost of those instruments to replace also adds up. 10% of this amount happens in sterile processing. We're going to break that apart a little bit. When we talk about, okay, so that's, that's the money side. Let's transition for now into the complex instrumentation, the complex surgery side of the business, okay? Who carries the bulk of the burden for, and there's no wrong answer here, I'm just curious what you think. Who carries the bulk of the burden for the time required to orient your, or orientate, is orientate a word? To get used to new technology, to train on it, to learn the manufacturers I have used, do any in-servicing, who carries the bulk of the burden for that time? Is it an equal split? Is there one department that you think carries the bulk of that more than the other? Isn't it equal? Because everybody has, everything, technology is changing every day. So mm -hmm. everybody has something, some new learning curve. Great, great. So yeah, so that time is split and the burden of, the bulk of that burden happens across departments. How about inventory management? Where does the bulk of the burden fall for inventory management when you deal with vendor sets, loaner sets, implants, things like that? CS. Yes. Okay. Uh, what about materials reprocess management? And say that again. Materials. Materials. Yep. Yep. Supply chain. Yeah. Uh, what about reprocessing and cycle times when you have new devices and you have to figure out if your, you know, your traditional settings on your sterilizer and your washer are going to be adequate for those new devices? Where does the bulk of the burden lie in that regard? Yeah, right. Yep. Okay, what about case scheduling? Obviously, this one's going to be pretty easy, but case scheduling. When you have a new surgery and you're not sure how long it's going to take, it's got new technology, it's a very complex surgery, how do you manage the schedule? Surgery. Yep, that's where the bulk of the burden lies there. And then how about add-on percentages? The more add-ons that you have, where is the bulk of the burden carried for those add-ons? Surgery and the scheduling, but then there's add-ons. That's another one that gets split, right? So everyone feels the impact of these changes, of the complexity changing in the healthcare space. Not just the OR, not just sterile processing, not just the clinics and surgery centers. It's spaced out, right? So everyone's carrying this extra weight on them in terms of the complexity of surgery and the complexity of technology. When we talk about improving turnover times, what does that mean to you? Limit, decreasing the amount of time between 
wheels in and wheels out of the patient. Great, great. So in order to do that, when you take a look at how many instruments you have in inventory, plus who's managing that inventory, you're going to get the length of time that surgical instruments are in the reprocessing cycle. So if it's each shift is responsible for making sure the throughput is there, if it's this, the management team in the department that's responsible for that, someone's responsible for making sure that the instruments are going to be there, be ready, be processed. And that will depend on how long they're in the reprocessing cycle. A decrease in case delays means less money wasted. Turnover time, an increase in turnover time means less case delays. So we all of a sudden feel this pressure, right, to turn things over quickly. But what are the burdens associated with quick turnovers? Mistakes, missteps, things missed. Yeah, We're going to talk cleaning. Improper cleaning. Yep. Yep. Increased IUSS. Yep. Those are all burdens that we carry when we're going toward this business goal of increased turnovers and less case delays. Okay. So here's my question to you. How do we do more with less? And we'll talk about staffing here in a little bit, but how do we do more with less? We have probably less staff, which we'll get to, than we need. We have more technology to familiarize ourselves with. We have less time to do education and to do in-servicing and to read through the 60-page manufacturer's IFU that's coming with these complex devices. So how is it, realistically speaking, and if you have the, the golden ticket, please tell me, and I will carry it with me around the world, <laughs> okay? But how do we do more with less? Any ideas? Management. Management. Okay. All right. So we're going to get into this a little bit. But yes, we'll get into that. Okay. So we talked about providing care. Let's talk about the idea of caring. Because honestly, I have three small kids, and sometimes they eat cookies right before dinner. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. Like, what? Where are my priorities in that moment? <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's just such a simple analogy. But when I'm working in sterile processing department and I've got three add-on cases and I was about to go home, but now I can't, am I going to care? I'm not saying should I, but am I going to care as much about being detail-oriented and making sure I follow every single step for those add-on cases as I would when I was there fresh-faced and bushy-tailed in the morning? Should I? Absolutely. Do I? How many of you have ever felt burnt out? <laughs> in life, like not even just in work, but just in life. We're all humans, right? We feel the weight of society, of our jobs, of our families. I've got three kids. I'm a sterile processing tech. I'm a VP of sales and marketing. I'm also a birth doula. And so there's a lot going on in just, just my life, let alone the lives of everybody around me, the things that they're trying to juggle. But burnout's a real thing, and compassion fatigue is a real thing. And we'll talk about what compassion fatigue is a little bit. But let's talk first about compassion. In your mind, if you tell someone, I have compassion, or I feel compassionate, what exactly are you trying to relate to them? That you're a caring person. You're a caring person. So then if I tell you I have compassion fatigue, what does that tell you? You're burnt out. Burnt that I care about a lot of things all the time. <laughs> and I'm tired. And I need some time. Right? So we're going to talk about burnout. We're going to talk about compassion fatigue. And we're going to talk about ultimately how do we keep that compassion? We're, and we'll talk about priorities too and how those play into it. There has been a lot of research, a lot of white papers, a lot of studies done on burnout in the nursing field, okay? And what's interesting to me, how many of you have ever been a part of a root cause analysis in your department? Okay. When you take a look outside of just one department, you look at healthcare as a whole, and you start to wonder what those root cause analyses look like, 
you start to wonder and you start to realize that sometimes the root cause of the issue is outside of the healthcare facility itself. And it draws your attention to the bigger issue. And this, I think, is a great representation of that statement. It says, this is um, the American Academy of Colleges, Colleges and Nurses. And they did a study in, in 2018 and 2019. And that study <clears throat> found that almost two thirds of the nursing schools responding to the survey pointed to a shortage of faculty or clinical preceptors as a reason for not accepting all qualified applicants into their program. So these shortages that we hear, the nursing shortages, the burnouts and things like that, we, we just assume that the problem and that the issues are within the healthcare facility. But there are bigger things at play lending it themselves to this. Why don't we have the faculty able to bring in all of the qualified applicants? Why don't we have the clinical preceptors able to work with these qualified applicants? Actually, you can make more in staffing nursing than you can as an educator. So mm -hmm. it's more difficult to bring them in. That's an interesting point. That's an interesting point. You know, one of the things that I think is really interesting, if you study sort of the projections of healthcare and of the specific um, jobs in healthcare. Currently, healthcare is responsible for 11% of all jobs in the United States. And it's projected that by 2026, healthcare will be responsible for 18% of all jobs. Also, it's also projected that by about 2030, so within the next 10 years, there will be six more people retiring than entering the field. So there'll be more people needing healthcare than there will be people to give the healthcare. The baby, the baby boomers, exactly, exactly. So what we're faced with is an increased demand, but a decreased ability to, to meet that demand. Okay, so these staffing shortages, these burnout conversations, these are conversations that have a huge impact in our ability as healthcare providers, as healthcare systems, and as a healthcare industry as a whole in this country to provide patient care on all three of those levels, the medical, the non-medical, and the emotional. How are we gonna do this? without the people to do it. We're talking about dental hygienists, medical assistants, dental processing techs, surgical techs. Those are all fields that are expected to have increased demand and not and a, a decreased, increased demand, but a decreased ability to meet the demand of those fields. Those are the people, those are the critical people that provide care in healthcare facilities. This really is a big issue. When we talk about the distribution of care, and you can insert anywhere you want in that little, that, those little um, marks. It can be responsibility, it can be care, it can be skill set, it can be expertise, whatever you want it to be. But the distribution of care in the OR has to be distributed among these things. You have to be able to address the surgeon's needs and the patient needs. How do you, how do you balance that? You have to be able to understand surgery prep, make sure the instruments are ready, that the sterile field is ready, that the patient is properly positioned. Reading patient labs and charts, that's a responsibility. So that's one area that you have to distribute your care in the operating room. Sterile draping, following best practices and guidelines, wound care post-surgical, those are all things like what, what percentage of your priority lands in each of those buckets? Let's talk about sterile processing. Sterile processing is an ever-changing environment. And we're seeing some really big changes within the past 10, 15 years, specifically around complex instrumentation, specifically around increased scrutiny, and rightfully so. I know we all think, oh, why is the magnifying glass on us? <laughs> why? But it's important that it is to hold people accountable and to understand and increase public awareness that this job is not just a job. This job is doing something that could save a life. This job is doing something that could end a life, potentially. So that increased scrutiny, if you look at it as though it's a good thing, then the, the resources that you need, the education you need, the training you need, the, dare I say, the pay you need and deserve, will hopefully follow suit to so that scrutiny, that, that magnifying glass on sterile processing. Bring it on, right? I talked about the aging population, the education requirements and the certification requirements. How many states require certification right now? 
Not very many, it's actually four. Yep, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, and Tennessee. And there are actually three more on deck. Um, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Colorado. I believe are the next, oops, the next ones on deck. Uh, yep, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and Colorado. So they have active legislation going right now. Nothing's passed yet, but maybe soon. Increased educational requirements. As all of these things happen, as the population ages and folks who have lent their expertise to the field for so many years now leave the field, there's an area of opportunity for expertise to be assumed by the next generation. Is that being properly assumed? And then let's talk about pay. Because with all of these increases in requirements for education and certification and more complexity in the surgeries and in the instrumentation, more scrutiny, more awareness of the importance of your job, shouldn't pay come along with that? And Dr. Peter Nichol is actually spearheading a project in the sterile processing space to make sure that that's called out, to draw attention to not only the importance of the role, but the deserving nature of compensation that's in line with that importance. Here's a question for you. Does everyone have a notebook or a piece of paper in front of you? No? Okay. So I'm gonna, oh. I'm gonna ask you to participate. It's gonna be great. Harmless, I promise. When you get your notebook or your piece of paper, hypothetically speaking, and you don't have to draw this specific pie chart, but a pie chart like it, pick your top five things that you care about most in your job, that you place priority on. And how are you, if you had a pie chart worth 100%, how are you to divvy up those priorities? Top five. In your job, if you had to pick the top five things that you care about the most, what percentage of priority would you give to those top five things? One more minute. So let's talk about the distribution of care in sterile processing. We talked about the distribution of care items in the operating room, and that's certainly a, a short list. Right? There are significantly more items that go into that distribution of care. But in sterile processing, how many of you had something along the lines of instrument reprocessing, either cleaning, inspecting, packaging, or sterilizing on your list of priorities? For the first one? No, not for the first one necessarily, oh. just on your list of priorities. Okay. How about Inventory management, if that's your responsibility. Okay. What about commu proper communication or good communication with the other departments that you work with? How about following best practices and guidelines? And then following the manufacturer's instructions for use. What are some other ones that you had on your list? My first one is education because if they don't have education, they can't, they don't know how to clean properly. And if it's not clean, you can't sterilize it. Mm -hmm. 
So number one for me was education. Number two was cleaning of instruments. Number three was sterility to make sure that things are happening properly for sterilizing. You can't do any of that stuff though if you don't have enough employees. Um, and then making sure time management, like you're getting your um, the needs met to the patient that's laying on the table. So making sure that you have everything done in a timely form. That's what I do. And when you made your pie chart, were some of those areas, I'm assuming the top top on your priority list had a larger percentage of the pie. Is that correct? Okay. Is that common for the rest of you? Had some with larger percentages, some with some with smaller percentages? Here's a question for you. Is it realistic to assume that your priority is all of those things 100% of the time? Okay, so as a person, if you don't want to share, you don't have to, how do you choose? I heard your priority list. Thank you for sharing that. And so my assumption is you prioritize education over the rest of those things. So if you feel like you're uneducated about a certain product, a certain process, you take the time to educate yourself first or your staff first before embarking on that I don't exciting you journey. I do the other things unless you have education. Okay. Okay. So here's, here's why I bring this up. We all have different priorities. And we all work in the same departments, trying to do the same job. So since we all have different priorities, how are we going to reconcile a disagreement on what should be more important than another thing? And it, hypothetically speaking. But I think, yeah, go ahead. My pie chart looks a little different. Like I didn't do the instruments versus education, whatever. Yeah. You know, I did like patient care, and um, my biggest thing is patient care, mm -hmm. and then like surgeon satisfaction, other staff satisfaction, that kind of stuff. Sure. I went to that. Um, but in that, like the patient care, to me, always trumps everything. And I had to have, we, I work in a very small facility, so I know surgeons name to name, whatever, yep. they stop in and ask questions, whatever. But in that we've had conversations, you know, like why I can't get something turned over because I am the lone soul in my group. You know, the other surgical techs are my cleaning people. Yep. You know, they do the dirty if they're not, if it's busy, I do it, whatever. So we work together in that and we're very tied together that way. But in that, you know, I always come back to even like you're at the end of the day, you know, and you're just kind of like, oh. but I always tell myself, I'm a very small facility. There's a lot of, we're a very rural community. Okay. At any point, a family member that I don't know could be using this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, so I always tell myself that. It's like, my son could be the next one to walk through that door. You know, somebody could be bringing him in to the ED and then mm -hmm. end up coming back to the OR. I process the stuff for the ED. I process stuff for all the outlying clinics. Right. You know, and <clears throat> we're related to like half the world up there. So, <laughs> 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 so at any time, you know, and so that keeps me always going, and, and not the guilt, you know, like if you choose to skip a step, it's like, oh my gosh, this is the one time mm -hmm. something happens because I chose not to do this with the roster, you know, but yeah, so I went different with my pie chart. That's great, and I expected that most people would have done it a little bit differently. It's because we're individuals, and our priorities are going to range, but just hearing the two of you, they're not that different because we're all in the same field and you educating yourself and having that as a priority is almost the same thing as having patient care your top priority. Because in educating yourself, first, it will lead itself to patient care. Yeah. The front of the surgeon, if he comes to right. me, why can't, my old facility, well, perfect example, we had a new surgeon come in. Um, his old facility would flash something and I said, I don't know how they're doing that mm -hmm. because according to the IFUs, you have to do this, this, and this. And he goes, well, they always did it. We didn't have an issue. And I said, but I do, because if that's a family member or if that's somebody, I said, how would you like it if it's your kid, whatever, da, da, da. And he just kind of turned around and walked away. He just like, okay, no, <laughs> and he was done, you know, yeah. but being educated to be able to hold your side of the thing to mm -hmm. be, no, this is why it is versus this is how we always did it, deal with it. 
So it's it's kind of a conversation of, of we're going to talk about leadership in a minute here, but my assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my assumption is that the leadership that you report to, you would term as good, a good positive leadership because to me when you recount that story you sound like you have empowerment to stand up for what you're doing mm-hmm. yeah. I, our, yeah i have to when i go to meetings and stuff with ast or issue ones i feel like i'm a lone star like, <laughs> sure not yeah. many facilities are like what we have <laughs> sure but, and here's something that I want to certainly point out is that leadership plays a big role in mitigating, in solving, and in, I'll just keep it there, mitigating and solving staff burnout. Because if your leadership in your department, or who, how many of you in this room are leaders in your department? Okay, great, great. So, <laughs> nice. so here's something that I wanna I want to encourage you to do, and we'll get you know down the road a little bit here with compassion fatigue and decision fatigue and things like that. But how often do you check in on your staff when you know that things are crazy? When you know that they're stressed out, when you know that, that things are flying at them in a million different directions, their workload is just making their head spin. How often do you take the time to say, okay, time out for 15 seconds. Let's all take a deep breath and remember why we're here. And then we can get back to work. Just that recentering. Those little things go such a long way because if you're going at 110 all day long without a break, without a chance to recenter, without a chance to collect your thoughts and to collect your feelings, because chances are at this point, your feelings are stress and anxiety and nervousness and anticipation for the end of the day. And if that's what you're running on for the last half of your day, of course you're gonna make mistakes. Of course you're gonna make errors. Of course you're gonna have burnout and you're gonna get home and say, gosh, what a crazy, crazy day. Do I wanna do that again tomorrow? But as leaders, you have an opportunity to, to have that recentering, even if it's for 10 seconds. Even if, if it's like, a, okay, take a break for just a second. Look at me, you're doing an awesome job. Thank you for what you're doing today. Those little things can go a really long way. They sound silly, but as far as burnout is concerned, think of how impactful that would be if that was you working your buns off to get all these trays turned over. If someone just came up to you randomly and was like, holy cow, you're doing an awesome job today. It's going to go a long way. One thing that Dr. Nickel is doing on behalf of Beyond Clean and also on behalf of the Department of Surgery at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine, is he's taking an active approach to building research around the current state of sterile, pro- sterile processing. I mentioned before that there are a ton of white papers and, and case studies and articles written about nursing burnout, but there's not a lot about sterile processing burnout, okay? not specific to sterile processing. Earlier this year, in collaboration with the U of W and Peter Nickel and with Beyond Clean, we put out sterile processing surveys. Some of you may have taken them. And what the goal with those surveys are is to push for national level improvements in things like salary, support, education, and safety in sterile processing. We need more research in this space so that we can take a look at what the current state, the active state of sterile processing and say, okay, this is what's not working or this is what really is working, let's keep adding resources to that. So there is research happening, which is a great thing. And I think a lot that will come out of that is this topic of sterile processing staff burnout and compassion fatigue, similar to what happens in the nursing field. I think this statistic is so interesting. In a recent, in a recent survey of human resources leaders, 95% of these <laughs> Has any of you conducted a, have any of you conducted a survey before? Mm-hmm. To get 95 people to say the same, or 95% of people to say the same thing is wild. But 95% of respondents said that burnout is sabotaging workforce retention. Burnout's a big deal. It sounds like something that you can just say flippantly and just say, oh gosh, I'm burned out. But it's a, it's a really big deal because it's costly for not only your healthcare organization, but for yourself 
as a human being. Burnout manifests itself in multiple ways, including a reduced physical and psychological energy. It manifests itself in things like insomnia. How many of you have sat, sat awake all night thinking, oh gosh, did I do this? Did I do that? What's tomorrow hold? You're like, yeah, that's my every night. No big deal. <laughs> but that's a sign of, of burnout. That's a manifestation of burnout. Headaches, fatigue, depression. All of these things are manifestations of burnout, and they can lead to increase in absenteeism. If you have staff members that constantly call in, they're constantly sick, is it because they're irresponsible or is it because they're burnt out? No. <laughs> maybe, maybe a mix for some, but chances are you can take a look and say, is it, is it burnout? Uh, turnover rates. They consequently have negative effects on the quality of care that we're able to give our instruments and therefore that we're able to give our patients. So burnout affects care. And in this business of caring that we're in, it has a huge impact. Burnout is not just for physicians and nurses. It stems from a work environment. It's not just about patient interactions. It's a work environment that causes exhaustion and frustration and anger over and over and over again. We're in a high stress, high impact industry. Okay? So those things are closer than they seem. Compassion fatigue applies to all healthcare workers, whether it's environmental services, whether it's surgeons, whether it's cafeteria staff who are dealing with that, you know that range of emotions that we talked about earlier. Even the staff in the cafeteria have to deal in some capacity with that range of emotions for the people that they serve. Okay? So it's all healthcare workers. I conducted a survey. So I was going to be a presenter at the National Isham meeting this year uh, that got canceled, unfortunately. But my topic was, is work-life balance a real thing in sterile processing? And one of the survey questions that I asked was, my career is my passion, and therefore I do work in my business same thing. Interestingly enough, so I had about 100, I had 106 people weigh in to this survey. Interestingly enough, over half of them either were neutral or strongly disagreed with that statement. So sterile processing is not the passion, and therefore work-life balance is a very different thing. So here's my question. This is just a, you know, a snapshot of the reality seen by some texts, by a majority of the texts that took, or the, the professionals that took the survey. I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, but what I am saying is how do we encourage people to care if it's not their passion? Because you think about the things you're passionate about. I'm passionate about my family, so I'm gonna care for them and care about them as often as I can, right? And I wanna say 100% of the time, but sometimes cookies for breakfast is a thing, <laughs> you know? I'm passionate about the work that I do with Beyond Clean because what we're trying to do is push the industry forward. We're trying to make education open and accessible for everyone, whether you're certified, whether you're not certified, whether you're new, whether you're old, whether you're super into it, or whether you're just doing it as your daytime job because you need the paycheck. It doesn't matter. We want you to feel like you have the tools and resources to be successful regardless of why you're here. So I'm passionate about that, both as a tech and as an advocate for this industry, and have been for almost 10 years now. But not everybody is passionate. And if I'm passionate about something, I'm going to care that extra amount. But if I'm not passionate about something, what's my incentive to care? Is there an incentive to care? Paycheck helps, that's an incentive. Professional development opportunities, that might be an incentive. Free lunch every once in a while from a vendor, hey, <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> but what's my incentive to care? If it's not my passion, why should I go that extra step? Why should I put all of those things on my priority list? But you also have two definitely strong topics where your career is your passion, but your work life is also your passion. Yeah. So you have two huge conflicts. Exactly, exactly. So how do you reconcile that? So let's say your work is your passion, but you don't want it to intersect with the rest of your life. You wanna keep a very firm line between those two things. So your priorities, 
Say that again. Be present in the moment. So you're at home. Mm -hmm. You're at home, mm -hmm. and that's the time that you're spending with your family, giving them what they need to feed them. When you're at work, be present there too. Make okay. sure that you're taking care of your employees or your your colleague colleagues and enjoying what they need there, giving them or stroking them. And, yeah. yeah. Over seventy percent of professionals check their email outside of work. It's just one of those things. It's like, where is where is the line? Is there a line? Does there have to be a line? And that's a very specific to you decision that needs to be made. When we talk about compassion fatigue, so if compassion means that we care, that we care for the tasks that we do on a daily basis, that we care for the patients on the receiving end of the tasks that we do, what happens when that compassion just runs out? And we experience compassion fatigue. We care so much that we get to a point where we just don't care anymore or we can't care anymore. I love this. Compassion fatigue is a condition characterized by both emotional and physical exhaustion that leads to diminished ability to empathize and feel compassion for others. So when we're at our end as humans, when we are cared out, <laughs> we have no more compassion to give. It actually takes on a negative effect. And compassion fatigue is commonly experienced by healthcare providers. How many of you know empaths, people who are just empathetic people, maybe outside the healthcare industry or within? Those people can also be impacted and have acute, they're acutely conscious of societal needs, but they feel helpless to solve them. They care about so many things, but it's like, where do I start? Compassion fatigue is a very real thing. Warning signs of compassion fatigue. And you might say, well, oh crap. <laughs> a lot of these I've experienced in, <laughs> in my recent past. But things like feeling exhausted, burnt out, or numb. Can, do you have emotions anymore? Sometimes I have to check myself and say, oh my gosh, I should be sad right now, but I don't feel anything. Or I see someone sick right now, but it's not affecting me. Is that an, a wall that I put up for, you know, preservation sake? Or is it because I'm, I'm just burnt out and I just don't have it in me to care or to feel those emotions anymore? So all these things are warning signs that you can use to check yourself and check your staff. Are they experiencing these things? This is fascinating to me. I want to give you this, this little um, equation. When we do a simple task and we're asked to repeat it, over and over again, and think about the tasks that we do in sterile processing. Some are simple, some are complex, okay? When we do a simple task and we repeat it, we're going to make a mistake or an error every five minutes. When we're asked to do a complex task and repeat it, we're gonna make an error every 90 seconds. And when we are asked to do a complex task, add some stress to the mix, <laughs> and repeat it, we're going to make an error every 30 seconds. Now let's apply that to sterile processing. Let's say, and Peter Nickel gave this example in his talk at Anoka, uh, Anoka Tech in March. Let's say that one of your shifts at your hospitals, probably not yours because it's probably just smaller, but one of your shifts at hospitals has 27 techs that come in. They clock in for the day. Those. <laughs> Let's say that the, the tasks that they do, and again, this is, this is a, an equation. I love how Peter laid this out. Those 27 techs are responsible for tasks, 50% of which are simple tasks, 50% of which are complex tasks. Okay? Of those complex tasks, 50% of those happen when you're super stressed out. Okay? So if those 27 techs are doing 50% simple, 50% complex, and the complex tasks, half of those happen when they're super stressed out. If you did the math, 10,000 errors during their shift would occur. No, not all of them are significant, right? Not all of them are going to lead to life-altering impacts. Not all of them are irreversible, but some of them are. And so with that equation, you can see how stress 
can affect the tasks that we do because a lot of it is repetition. Okay? Complex, easy, whatever it may be, when you look at a department like that and you see, okay, there's an opportunity for a lot of error in our department, you can kind of see the impact that having those burnt out texts can actually have on your department when it comes to medical errors. Medical errors lead to 440,000 deaths every year. Isn't that wild? Every single year, 440,000 deaths from medical errors. It's one of the top three causes of deaths. It's just wild. And how many of those are the responsibility or happened because of an error that happened in your department? I don't know. Right? So why does this conversation matter? I mentioned that there's a lot of studies, a lot of papers written about burnout in the nursing field. Not a lot in stir processing, but hopefully there will be more. But I want to I want to pose a couple of questions to you. So we're tasked with making a lot of decisions. And compassion fatigue can also come with decision fatigue. How many of you have been forced to make so many decisions or choose between so many different options that you just freeze? You just are like, I'm out. <laughs> Someone else's responsibility. <laughs> I can't handle it right now. That's decision fatigue. That's a thing too. You're constantly tasked with making decisions all day long. What cycle should I use? What should I inspect this instrument for? Does it have hinges? Or do I inspect the joints where it comes together? What, do we, what, are the, what, am, what are all the decisions that I need to make on a basis? But one of the things that I want to challenge you to do, especially when it comes to the big decisions that you have to make on a department level, and leaders in the room, I encourage you to certainly encourage your staff to feel empowered to ask these questions to prevent burnout and to prevent things like compassion fatigue and decision fatigue. Ask these types of questions. Does this decision have to be made today? As a sterile processing tech, you feel pressure to make quick decisions all the time, just rapid fire, decision, decision, decision. Yes, no, I'll bring it to you, I won't bring it to you, I'll, I'll flash this, I won't flash this, okay? We're asked to make those decisions often, all day long. So if you can feel empowered to ask, okay, does this decision have to happen in the next minute, in the next hour, in the next day. What's the priority? Who else can help me make the safest decision? One of the things that I find fascinating is when I talk to sterile processing leaders who make it a point to encourage their staff to ask questions and to ask for assistance, especially when it comes to making hard decisions. If they feel like they can make a safe decision in co collaboration with someone else, do they feel empowered to do that? Do they feel like they'll be encouraged to ask for help or will they be put down for asking for help? Another question that can be asked, how important is this decision? This goes back to your pie charts. Is it a decision that will have lasting impacts, negative or positive? And if so, who else can I involve? So going back to that second question, am I in my lane? Do I have the authority to make this decision? Do I have the skill set to make this decision? These are all things that if you encourage your staff to talk about, okay, where is my area of expertise? If I know that one of my coworkers is the endoscope expert in the department, and I have a question from a clinic about an endoscope, am I gonna feel good about going and asking that person instead of just feeling like I have to make that decision right then and there? Do I have that, that feeling of collaboration in the department to help ease that? When we share the responsibility for decisions made, and when we feel like we're truly working as a team, we have the opportunity to take that beat, to take that breath, and come to a choice that's the safest choice for a patient, and that's the safest choice for the instrumentation that we're processing. So we're all humans, right? We have finite emotional capacity. I love this quote. Whenever you neglect your own well-being while overextending yourself in the care and concern of others, which I'm guessing all of us do often, okay? If you do that for a prolonged period of time, you'll eventually experience an equal opposite reaction of numbing and detachment. So you can have it in your best 
You can try everything you can to always care, to give all of yourself all day long in every situation, but there's a capacity for your care. And that capacity, once it's met, will have the opposite reaction, the opposite effect. If left unchecked, compassion, compassion fatigue will eventually cause you to turn away from the very thing you care deeply about because of emotional burden. The more you care, and the fewer times you do that self-check, the more you put yourself in the opportunity, the more you give yourself the opportunity to experience that burnout and not have any more room. So I'm going to encourage you all in your departments to explore the idea and to be open to the idea of having the, the hard conversations about, okay, where is your capacity? How you got, have you reached your capacity for today? If you have, take a walk, <laughs> regroup, recenter, do what you need to do because the people at the end of the day who are going under, who are gonna have surgery, they need you just as much as the people at the beginning of the day. And if you're burnt out, they're gonna get a lot less of you than the people at the beginning of the day. Healthcare is a business. And our ability to care within healthcare does have its limits. But the good news is, is we can check in on those limits and we can refuel so that we can lend that care as often as possible to the patients who need it most. Burnout and fatigue lead to errors. Complex instruments require more focus, which could translate into could require more care because they require more focus. Recognizing your own limitations will allow you to to give that care freely and to allow your capacity to care to benefit your work environment and to benefit the patients who they maybe don't know it, but they need you. <laughs> With that, I'll encourage you all to keep fighting dirty. That's what we do in sterile processing. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for having me join you. I love Wisconsin. I love it here. So I appreciate you all. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the day. Oh, I do have a question. Um, so what is your background again? You said you're a doula. And <laughs> yeah, so I've been in the sterile processing field. I worked at Key Surgical for 